Hey, welcome everybody. It's Charlie. Uh, this is the podcast To Hell and Back. Um, at this point, because I don't do much product production with my podcast, you're supposed to imagine whatever music you want to hear when you start a podcast. And now, uh, so that I can go ahead without having to do that. Um, and so, welcome everybody. Um, as, as, and it's uh, the 23rd of January. It's Thursday. It's six o'clock at night in the East Coast uh, of America. And, um, uh, and as you know, this podcast is really to deal with uh, uh, use DBT concepts and skills, as well as other things that we pull in to um, to generate ideas about how to cope with adversity in life, uh, whatever the nature of the adversity is. Um, and so one of the, um, you know, what we're doing right now is we're uh, starting part two of a conversation between myself and Seth Axelrod, who's also on uh, and also will be talking in just a minute. All the rest of you are all muted if you're getting on this. Um, uh, unless you specifically unmute yourself at the bottom lower left-hand corner of your screen where there's a mute and an unmute button. But we want to keep most people muted just so there's no extra noise. So um, Seth and I are going to continue a conversation we started last week about uh, the experiences that he's had um, in coping with cancer uh, since it was first diagnosed six years ago. And uh, he talked some about it last time, just to, to remind you, or if you didn't hear last time, Seth is a, an associate professor of psychiatry. Of, he's a psychologist, a PhD psychologist, who's associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University, and he's the head of their DBT services. He's a uh, trainer and consultant for Behavioral Tech, uh, a DBT training company. Um, he won the award as outstanding educator in the universe last yeah. uh, November, because <laughs> there isn't another one of these. So you can say whatever you want. You know, you can be Trumpian about it. You know, you know, you're 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 the best ever <laughs> in the entire universe, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, and and lots of other things that I now know about Seth that I didn't know before. But um, that it may, that would make too long of an introduction. So, so Seth is, uh, has been dealing with a, a bone cancer that he was diagnosed with, and that you can hear about it in the last podcast. And we're going to go through today, and we're going to go through next week, another hour of this, really trying to get at what's the nature of the experiences that he's had to cope with having cancer, and what has he brought to bear in coping with cancer, and, and what can other people learn from that just by listening in? Um, I do want to make a couple other preliminary comments. Um, one was that uh, we did receive some emails with some comments and questions. Both Seth got some and I got some, and we'll probably comment on those. Um, we've got way, way more than any possible getting to. And the other thing is um, that I wanted to alert you because one of the emails was a person who wor has worked with Marsha Linehan in Seattle on a book that's going to come out in the fall from Guilford Press and it's going to be called Coping with, Can Coping with Cancer with DBT. Um, and so she and Marsha Linehan worked for years on putting together how DBT as a package of uh, strategies and skills and concepts can help somebody cope with cancer. And I, I had heard about that before, but forgot that she was writing that and that they were writing that. I heard about it from Marsha a couple of years ago, and I've heard about it from Guilford Press. And, and Seth, may, Meth, Seth knows her more personally than I do. Her name's Elizabeth Stunts. And Liz is in Seattle, and she's listening, or I don't know if she's listening tonight, but she listened uh, last time, and she wrote in and commented. And, I, and we asked her if she could say about the book so, so I could inform you about the book. So... It'll be called Coping with Cancer Using DBT. It's going to come out in the fall of 2020. It's Elizabeth Stunts and Marsha Linehan, Guilford Press. Uh, and it's really for a lay audience, but I think it's for any audience uh, too, professional as well as lay. Um, and they've used DBT skills. And, um, and she's, she really went through more than I'm going to share 
right now, but it's, it looks like a really interesting book. I just saw the chapter titles and it really is oriented to how do you use mindfulness and wise mind and radical acceptance and, and uh, co coping with the facts of life and regulating your emotions and dealing with your interpersonal skills. And the last chapter being dealing with sort of deeper issues about the meaning of life uh, from the point of view of coping with cancer. So uh, I really uh, just encourage you to consider looking for that book when it comes out. Um, so, gosh, Seth, hey, do you want, Seth, welcome again. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm uh, a little less terrified than last week. I'm still <laughs> noticing being a little bit nervous, but... Um, but I uh, felt really good about having the first interview and I really enjoyed um, chatting and stepping into this public um, uh, offering of my story and, and uh, hoping that people can get things from it. Mm. Uh, so I really appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate speaking with you and uh, mm. I appreciate everyone listening. Um, mm. uh, I, I did get to, I don't know uh, Liz well, who, who wrote the book. I think she might be in New York. Uh, I, I oh, really? Say, okay. I think she's been doing groups with folk with cancer and been using the skills for a long time. Oh. And uh, I've gotten to sit down with her and hear her ideas, which um, I, I, I remember relating to, but I haven't seen the book. Uh, when I look at the chapters, uh, it strikes me that this could be a really useful thing. So mm. if people mm. do find this talk is helpful, I would imagine that that might be another springboard. Mm. Yeah. Hey, you know, speaking of springboards then, I wanna I, I wanted just go to, a, you know, we have a structure in mind and you and I have had a discussion about it and I've put down some ideas about it, but I want this to flow with wherever we wanna go. And where I just think of right now when you say that is that one of the emails that we got and I passed on to you too, was from John in North Carolina and, uh, and uh, who's done a podcast with me about mm. antidotes for the holidays, DBT antidotes mm. for getting through the holidays uh, a couple times. But John wrote a question and then he addressed it to you. And I'm going to ask you just to jump in and see yep. if you can say some things about it. What has Seth or others, if not his experience, found helpful to help cope with the 3 a.m. eyes wide open, heart racing panic that, quote, this cancer is happening inside me? So I just wonder if you know what he's talking about and if you could say some things about what you know about that. Yeah, well, I, I can definitely relate to some disrupted sleep on, the, on this cancer business. I can definitely, um, uh, uh, I think I hear two different things. One is the eyes wide open kind of thing, which I can relate to at different points. Um, uh, one thing which I'm, I'm guessing we'll speak about some this evening is the amount of fear that I had that for me wasn't attached directly to this cancer inside me exactly. It was more the process I was hearing of how it was gonna get out of me originally, which was this surgery, which for me was just this terrifying idea that I was gonna go through and I can share some about it. Um, but, there were, but there were other times, some of the, some uh, different kinds of worries that would come up that could keep me up at times. Mm. Um, one thing I can, I can say what I uh, typically have done is probably uh, similar to what a lot of people, I think most of us as adults have dealt with some insomnia here and there. So I think a lot of it's the typical things, doing the things to try to get your body to settle down and go to sleep, um, uh, realizing when you're not gonna go to sleep so you get out of bed, um, go, whether it's leaning in the direction of what's gonna give my brain something else to focus on, or sometimes when I'm really being uh, mindful and insightful about it, um, finding something to accept. And even if that doesn't mean going back to sleep, it might be accepting that you're not going back to sleep, mm. but finding something that you're stirred up about um, and doing that. Um, I can say that um, uh, uh, I did, looking back over my story, looking over the timeline of things, there, uh, I did one of Marsha's retreats uh, since the diagnosis. I've done two of her retreats. One was before, one was during. And uh, she, um, she really re reached out to me around the cancer business. And 
at the retreat, she took the opportunity to speak to this very issue. And she pointed out a couple of things that are in her sleep hygiene protocol, mm. which I did have, tr I'll say I tried, those weren't my magic bullets. She pointed out to her um, exercise of the breathing and counting down her, her nine zero, wherever she refers to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other one, the other one, which I will sometimes use, and she suggested, was to do uh, the temperature, you know, which to me is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. If you're in the, if you're trying to fall asleep at night, I think of cold water is going to wake me up. And yet right. she's right. It works to the tip skill works. It mm -hmm. brings your system down. But mm -hmm. that's separate from, that's separate from, um, ultimately, this gets back to radical acceptance. Ultimately, this gets back to the mind freaking out over what in what is this thing that's happening, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so so is it the band aid of managing to get your mind to stop, or is it actually taking some steps that let you start settling down again because you're mm -hmm. not fighting it, mm -hmm. you're not you're not running mm -hmm. from it. Let me ask you more about, yeah. I, I think this radical acceptance, I mean, and talking about fear, um, it goes right at the heart of uh, other experiences I think that people have had and I've had it. But I was thinking about cancer for the past two weeks more than I usually do, not as much as you do. Um, and uh, I was thinking if I were having to radically accept that I have cancer, First, I would think, okay, there's the idea of cancer. So I have to radically accept the idea that I have cancer and then the associated ideas. Oh, cancer is going to shorten my life. Cancer is going to change my life. Chan cancer is going to mean I have to give up some things, might lose some people, might, you know, might change how people react to me, might make me less capable. I mean, there's all these things that are more like ideas. And then there's, uh, as one person who wrote to you said something about um, the, like, do I, is it, am I accepting pain? Mm. This is the physical pain that can be part of cancer and often is, or, or the discomfort of treatments. Or as I, I said to you, uh, wrote you an email that included saying that a, a close friend of mine and somebody that you knew, uh, that the thing she found most intolerable that she had to actually work and she did deliberately work because she was a DBT teacher um, was radical acceptance of nausea. Yeah. Uh, when she had chemotherapy treatment, she had nausea that was actually, she described as being worse than her physical pain. And they didn't at that point quite yet have this, some wonderful anti-nausea drugs. And so she didn't have access to those. And it was just unbearable. Um, so there was, in her case, accepting nausea because she couldn't make it go away, accepting physical pain sometimes, accepting that she had to go in for another treatment, another trial, accepting yep. un the uncertainty of life. So I wonder, when you break it down, cancer is so many things. So could you talk a little about, in your case, what, what, did, what did you really, what do you mean by radically accepting whatever you were radically accepting? Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right that there's all these different facets and all these different pieces of reality. And, you know, one, one is the, the simple identity issue of being, I'm a person with cancer. And something that I, I really struggled with, I mean, we struggled with in terms of it kept coming back again and again was clearly that's wrong. You know, here I've been this healthy person. I've taken good care of my body. I've exercised. I've eaten right. You know, I stopped eating red meat when I was 20. So, I mean, it's really, you know, living this kind of a life. And I have cancer and it's kind of, it's this, it's this, um, uh, there's a line in the musical Into the Woods by Stephen Sondheim where the baker's mm. wife sings, I'm in the wrong story. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. you know, it really is that experience that, wait, this isn't my story. This is, right. what is this? What, you know, and, and going, uh, you know, suddenly, being in medical gowns and being examined and all these kinds of things. And it's like, wait a minute, what's that? So there, there, you know, that one, mm. um, I was acceptance. And I think, I think that that one was probably more of an acceptance that was more of the way 
generically we talk about acceptance taking time and acceptance being this kind of thing that you kind of ease into um i don't i don't feel like i tackled that one with radical mm. acceptance but it was one example of mm. one facet of it where my mind was definitely saying no that's wrong and had to kind of keep noticing and, and yeah. bring it back to actually that's right um it still seems odd to me that i that i have this diagnosis yeah uh, but there's less of kind of little catches in my brain that kind of stop and say wait what like it's it's gotten there on yeah this um a different one is um which somehow is different i don't know how it's different but getting cancer how did it happen that cancer happened yeah you know, yeah how is this and yeah. and the part and the kind of looking for causes yeah. like wait a sec and and um one thing that you've brought up in some of our correspondence is um uh the way marcia originally uh uh put radical acceptance in her in the skills book back in 93 really was the concept you know this idea of bringing yourself to acceptance turning yourself over totally right what in the world does that mean you know right. and i remember reading that book and and just seeing right. this as these are just words like this really this is clearly not an important thing these other things are important i don't know what this is yeah it's the most important thing and and yeah people who spend time in dbt come to that realization uh something that um i actually so in the in the next book which you which you've uh, mentioned again the correspondence uh is not there's the concept of it but there's also steps involved um this is something that i have some pride there's some places i've gotten to things i've gotten to do within the dbt world uh one thing i got to do which which i take a lot of pride in and was very special to me was i got to be part of this small group uh, uh you may have been i'm sure you must have been also some of the people who got to work with some of the drafts that marcia was working on mm -hmm. and to give some input on some of what she was doing mm -hmm. and uh and raise things that helped at times shape some of what happened and mm -hmm. one thing that um the uh draft that i saw she um had something similar to the 93 book and i asked her about the video series that behavioral tech did in, in i think it was 2006 maybe or yeah. 2002 whenever it was yeah this wonderful video series where she instructs and she really lays out these clear how do you go about radically accepting yeah and she presents it in this very stepwise oh here are steps that you take to do radical acceptance and i, right. and I said marcia uh, you know th that was fantastic. It was so clear on how to do it. Right. And, she, and and if you know Marcia, her answer was, "Oh, I forgot all about that. I haven't right. thought about that since I did it, and I right. never seen it." And and I and she actually got excited, and she went and she found the materials and she put it in the book. You know. Seth, so you're so responsible for that. I I, I think I I want to say it. I <laughs> That's think wonderful. I, directed her back to herself it wasn't mine no, but no no i had been i had already in my book i would already taken her videos and turned those into my handouts and i sent those to her and said hey marcia here's what i've got oh no that's so there great. are some of my stuff that get mixed in there yeah but it was her stuff back at her i was a mirror well you know as you know then very well the the steps that she wrote are actually she calls them guidelines in the book too yeah and um, and they don't have to be done sequentially but I wonder in those steps they give you some specific ideas yes. about how to accept <clears throat> something and it and it starts with you have to recognize what you're not accepting right and, and then so going on from there can you give a couple of examples of, of how you've taken steps to try to accept whether it's the fact that you have cancer or the uh, pain of the cancer or whatever the ordeal I, of it i can do different ones if i go to the fact of cancer you know the fact of how does this diagnosis happen and and i you know there are times where for me it is the turning myself over more of the conceptual but other times where it very much is looking at those those steps and um something that she presents as a step is tracing the history you know and really kind of saying this that when our that one way that that we 
fight reality or that I'll fight reality is that question why why is why did this happen you know how could this happen it shouldn't have happened right. and to be able to look at reality and say that a history led up to this moment yeah that however whatever whatever if this moment exists there must have been previous moments that went in the direction leading to this moment yeah and if we can go back and notice the history and then then we can say well of course this moment must be it's, a, it's intellectual it's reasonable mind but it's intellectually saying well of course this moment must be because look at the history that led up to it that came you know moment after moment and cause after cause until mm. this reality now with cancer right i can definitely i can definitely say i started with a very kind of generic um you know some kind of whether that's a i don't know if that's a diathesis stress or whatever that is of there must have been some kind of vulnerability there must have been some kind of toxin or something that that would have triggered whatever that is in my mind it was a very kind of just trying to put together and speculate whatever that recipe is that makes cancer happened you know clearly this combination whatever that combination is must have occurred in just that such such a way that the cancer started and then there it is um and even and even not knowing like well what is that exactly I, at one point as i'm like searching and i'm trying to see like well where did it come from and i notice you know i i typically bring my lunch to work in plastic containers and i toss the plastic containers in the microwave and i eat my lunch have i poisoned myself you know as the, as the plastic microwave plastic is the reason that i got cancer and then and then of course you want to let go of self-blame because oh did i hmm you know um something that was reassuring that actually it was probably a year or two later there i uh came across an interesting study where they looked at um a, a several different cancers i think about 20 different cancers mm -hmm. and they looked at um to, to try to get at what's the what's the uh genetic environmental mix on the cancers mm -hmm. and they looked at what's the rate of cell division that each mm -hmm. of these different organs or these different kind of things have mm -hmm. what's the expected rate of the kind of mutation that will cause cancer mm -hmm. and look at different cancers and see does that cancer occur at the expected rate be, because of just basic cell division and there's no environment or does it show up a lot more than you'd expect right in which case it must be environment and what they found was that with some cancers like say lung cancer the cancer shows up at much higher incidence than you'd expect on that mathematical you know yeah. and yeah. you can say well look there must be environmental for bone cancer it's right smack where you'd expect it to be without any environmental anything yeah and they actually say in the article that those cancers are the bad luck cancers <laughs> just absolute bad luck just bad just, just it was just cell division it was this mutation thing. so now i i take that one single study and in my mind it actually appeases me even that much more that the causes i still don't know you know well why did that number get rolled why is that there but it did and people do get uh cancer um i don't think you meant i don't think we said it on this i think it was outside of our conversation but i know you've mentioned this on other podcasts about cindy sanderson and about that question of going from why me to well why not me right you right know? and so right. so in the radical acceptance for me if i find myself fighting uh sometimes i will go back to those steps and i'll kind of notice i'm fighting I'll notice what is the reality. The reality is I have cancer. I might take the time to spend time with those causes and to really notice what are the causes. Something else that I do and the way I teach it is to from there go to a next step of deliberately doing some mindfulness acceptance practice, do some breathing, uh, doing some um, everything is as it is. Mm -hmm. um, everything is mm -hmm. as it should be mm -hmm. breathing in and out letting it go um uh 
practicing opening into willing hands while I'm doing this to really kind of release with my body. This thing. Uh, it sounds to me like that, like, and it, I, I find this important in understanding it in general radical acceptance. But I know, I know if I had cancer, I would be going through something like what you're describing. I just know I would be think because my interest was originally in biology and I used to study cell division and cell membranes a lot. Uh, I would be thinking that's where my mind would be going is, okay, there was a mutation. Of course, why was there a mutation? Or was there's a mutation every once in a while? Of course, there's a mutation every once in a while. But you know, we're all so exceptional in the way we think of ourselves. We think, I'm not going to be the one that gets a mutation. I'm not going to be the one that has my cells start to proliferate. I know about that. That's what happens to other people. In fact, it's so interesting. I mean, when I was re when you sent me a series of, uh, of, of Facebook posts that you did around the time you were before diagnosed, during diagnosed, before surgery, that late 2013, early 2014, I read through them twice. It was just so, it was like reading a whole story in itself. And it just captures so many things that you do so skillfully and also what you were hit with all of a sudden, like a tidal wave that you were negotiating. But one of the things you wrote there, and you wrote it twice, one in one post, you wrote something about how it's so weird because you go and the doctor says something about cancer and you're thinking, who, who has cancer? Like me? You're not talking about me, are you? And of course, there, there's cancer over here and there's you over here and you haven't yet merged. I mean, you haven't accepted. And then another one that you said was that your wife at a certain point would talk with someone else be talking about your cancer and you'd be listening thinking, Who's she talking about? You know, I, like, yeah, 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 those are very understandable because, and they are indications that that radical acceptance that you have cancer is a process that you hack away at, I think. And, yeah. and my experience of radical acceptance, and I've taught a, some radical acceptance podcasts earlier in this whole series a year or two ago, but but I really realized that you set the stage for radical acceptance and then it happens. You cannot force radical acceptance. Yes. So Mark, guidelines are good. You keep hacking away at it. Keep saying, okay, so I'm having pain. Oh yeah, my pain is because of my cancer. Is it really? Maybe it's from something else, actually. Maybe I have indigestion or maybe I just have a, a rib that's protruding, you know, and right. causing trouble. But, and then it, it takes like a whole process, I think. And finally, your identity is, I, I am a person with cancer. And it, and I wonder how does that change you in the world when you've gotten to that identity? You're, in other words, how does, when you get, when you radically accept I have cancer and I have the manifestations of cancer and these things that are happening are because I have cancer and it isn't all of who I am, but it is now part of me. Could you say a little about, cause I think it'd be of interest and it's definitely of interest to me. Like how does that change your idea of who you are in the world, what your possibilities are, what your relationships are like, what your family is. I mean, it must yeah, be, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 I wanna answer it. I also wanna, I wanna um, say something which, which you're familiar with, I think a lot of our listeners are, is this, this you know, radical acceptance, you, you, it, it, it's not a static thing, but it's something that you do and then you lose it and you come back. But the more you do it, the more often you're there, you know, so right. that right. process, but, um, you know, one, what it does to who you are, at least for me, um, this, um, you, one, one aspect of it is living this dual existence of which, which really is a, um, which is really looking at the mortality thing. It's really looking at, you know, cancer, is a scary word because it conjures death. You know, it conjures, oh, cancer is something that kills people. And um, getting the cancer diagnosis, the obvious question or the obvious fear is this is gonna kill me. You know, this is, you know, so you're facing your mortality. Um, we normally live our lives with the, um, with the, uh, blissful ignorance that we're going to live forever. You know, we, we live our lives with the, you know, which of course we know isn't true, but we, we, 
let ourselves live and where we close our eyes to, that's something that happens later. That's something that's way off in the distance. That's not something, you know, until perhaps you're in, in significantly later life, you kind of live your life. Oh, that's later. And cancer says, well, well, we don't know that that, that may not be true. Right. right. And, and so, um, uh, now this also changed a little bit from my early diagnosis to later. Um, the original diagnosis, um, you know, so the diagnosis, it's a bone cancer, I'll label it, it's chondrosarcoma. So it's a, it's a bone cancer that starts within the cartilage of the bone. So a chondrosarcoma. And um, there's different grades, which is basically how much mutation there is in the cells and how aggressive it's going to be. And, and the big distinction is low grade or high grade. And for a low-grade chondrosarcoma, um, it's a difficult diagnosis because it shows up somewhere. It's anywhere where you have bone or cartilage in your body. It can show up there. And the primary treatment is surgery. Get that out. Get it out cleanly. Don't leave anything. Because it likes to come back. And even if they get it cleanly out, there's a 10% chance it's going to show up at the same, at wherever was adjacent to that area, it's going to start up again. So it's hard to shake. Um, but on the other hand, if it's low grade and you get a nice clean surgery for it, there's a 90% chance that people with, with my diagnosis, if it's low grade, are cured of the cancer. Wow. There's a shadow over them because that 10% can really happen any time over the rest of their life. Huh. It's particularly high risk earlier on, but there's mm -hmm. cases where 20 years later, boom, there it was. It was dormant and now it's started up again. Mm. So you have a shadow. So you have that shadow of, is it going to come back um, with that low grade? Mm -hmm. When I first was diagnosed, I, um, they did a biopsy to confirm it was cancer. The biopsies... Um, can be a little bit inaccurate uh, because they're getting a sample of tissue. They can only see what they got the sample of. And um, if they get low grade sample, well then they know there's low grade there. And there's about a 95% chance that that's all it is, just low grade. But there's about a 5% chance they missed it and it was, also, it was high grade mm. because of the sampling. Mm. So when I first had my diagnosis, the biopsy said low grade. Um, because the location of the cancer, there was no way they were going to get big, clean margins out of this because it was against my, it was on my spine. Right. And, and the spinal cord is there. Right. So you're already out of luck. There's no right. big margins. No big margin there. No big margin. So it's really about getting the best margin you can. Um, I can share about that. I was with one surgery team. I ended up going to a different surgery team, uh, which I'm so thankful I did because I, I'm, I wouldn't be sitting here. I don't believe I'd be sitting here if I'd stayed with the first team, uh, which unfortunately is also a painful reality of, uh, of this cancer is um, uh, it often doesn't get the, the treatment it needs. And then the outcome is, is worse. Yeah. Yeah, which is a whole other thing. There's lots, there's lots of layers to all this. Um, but in either case, when I, when I, um, getting back to this identity thing, when I did get to my second treatment plan, which I can go into, the focus was on if we can get this right, if we can get the, if the surgery is successful, if the, and I had radiation to try to help because I couldn't get the big wide margins mm -hmm. with the radiation plan, if, if it's successful and I can get through this, what really was a massive surgery, Mm -hmm. there was light at the end of the tunnel that I could end up in that 90% group. I'll have to recover from major, major surgery, but I could have a road of the rest of a, whatever my natural lifespan would be, you know, I'd have the shadow over me, but I could, there was a reasonable chance, maybe, that I could be on that road. Mm -hmm. Um, so even then it's the, you know, you're looking, I mean, for me, it was, it was, um, uh, dealing with, <laughs> am I gonna, 
am I going to get through this surgery, which they told me I would, but my mind didn't believe that. So the radical acceptance for me, you know, so much of it was around, um, I don't know how much time I have on this planet, you know, and that right. here I am walking around. And I think that's something that I would imagine a lot of people with cancer, I would imagine may identify with is this experience of, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of being a walking death, like you're, like you're carrying death with you and wherever you go. And when people hear this, you are alive and yet not alive in some way. And that's a, that's a, it's, so there's a lot of these existential challenges mm. that mm. come up with that. Deeply. And, yeah. Mm. And early on, I mean, that was definitely, I mean, there's still aspects of that, but that was much more challenging. Here I am. I'm still living. I'm working on um, uh, my treatment plan. I'm, uh, I hadn't been exercising much for a year because I've been in pain. Mm -hmm. I started exercising, eat, you know, I'm exercising every day. I'm eating, I'm, I'm basically training for this surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but dealing with this, um, what, what are these, which of these roads is going to be my path? Am I on the living oh, road or am I on the not living road? It's unbelievable. It's like having a, it's like you've been informed that there's a murderer in your house. Yes. Uh, but you don't know where they are and yes. you don't know whether it's a bad murderer and you don't know who, who it'll kill. And, 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 and you send for the police and they come and they look in three out of the four rooms in your house and they say, it's all clean. But there's another room. I mean, it's sort of like, and, and you don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, it's well, radical well, acceptance of uncertainty. Well, but you know the killer is only, only there to kill you. It's only there to kill you, right. And unfortunately, right. another piece of this, which was, you know, very stressful, such, I mean, in terms of the, the acceptance, um, is, uh, you know, they weren't there to kill my family. Mm -hmm. But that murderer is there. And is that murder going to get me? Um, so one thing, you know, when I, when I um, got the diagnosis and I uh, was informed by a, by a, um, a, a surgeon, um, by an orthopedic surgeon who was putting together the team that was going to, you know, was saying, we're going to get this out of, you know, we're going to do a, the surgery. It's going to be a significant surgery. We have to figure out how to do it because this is not a typical surgery, but we have a good team and we're going to figure this out. Mm. We're going to talk to each other. We're going to figure out how to get that, how to do this. Mm. Um, and uh, um, uh, as this is going on, I'm trying to think where I'm going here because I'm, I want to transition from my first team to my second team. My first team was trying to sort out how to, how to approach things. Um, and I'm pretty terrified of the surgery, but of course I know I'm going to do it. Still sorting out that I even got the diagnosis. Um, not yet radically accepting all these things I had this fear of. I was just like, in, I was in a tremendous kind of high anxiety state. Um, and I think I was, I was uh, doing a very, I think I was being very effective at accepting that I was at a very high anxiety state. Um, mm -hmm. I was functioning at a very high anxiety state. Mm -hmm. So I was going to work, I was talking to people, I was putting these Facebook posts together, kind of letting the world know, um, being aware that there's something happening around me, there's something happening around my family. I think that we, you know, it'd be important for us to, to potentially have support coming toward our, the family because mm -hmm. we're in a crisis state mm -hmm. um, and continue to go to work and let work know um, here's what's going on. Um, I think I can still work while I'm, while I'm, you know, while we're sorting this out. And when I would work, when I would do my uh, work in clinical setting and it's, it's a, it's a group based uh, day hospital setting where we do our DBT it, Mm -hmm. It's modified DBT for a day hospital setting. So I'd be in group settings. One thing that I encountered was the um, distract by contributing skill, 
was so powerful that I could be at work, I could focus my attention on who who was I working with, you know, yeah. what was going on there, and yeah. be in those moments and let go of what was happening. And maybe my co-therapist or my my trainees, you know, might might be doing something, maybe the anxiety would start pulling on me. And I could bring myself back. And again, I was there. And I was, um, I think because I was accepting the anxiety and accepting my state, Mm -hmm. um, I was communicating. I was uh, confirming with my supervisors, you know, hey, this is what's going on. I think I'm okay working while I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, I am, I am distracted. I wasn't sleeping great. I am distracted. I was still in my chronic pain. Um, but I think I can function and do this. And I think it would be helpful, you know, for me to be able to be here and do this, told my students, told my patients, this is what's going on. I've got cancer. I'm headed for some surgery. I've got a lot of anxiety Mm. and I'd like to be here doing this. Mm. And if anyone has concerns about how I'm doing with my work, you know, if anyone might, I said first to my students and covered that, those background. And then I said the same thing to my patients. If you see anything that concerns you, if you feel like I'm too distracted, I'm anything, mm-hmm. please go straight to the supervisor, you know, to the, to the program manager. And you can let them know. Mm. And they'll let me know. You could tell me, you could tell the students, or you could go straight to the program manager. Um, if you have any concern about how I'm doing. And I think it was my radical acceptance of the anxiety of the crisis that allowed, I think I'd make a direct connection there that allowed me to say, this is it. This is where I am right now. So the I, earth, think, Seth, I think, Seth, it's a reciprocal connection because I think once you start publicly saying, I have cancer and uh, please go to the program manager if you're concerned about it, you're, you're being about as transparent as a human being could be at that moment, which I think probably feeds into radical acceptance. Because if you hear yourself say that to a few people, and then you know everybody knows, it's increasingly hard to sort of tuck it away and say, maybe I don't have it. You wake, <laughs> wake up the next day yeah. and say, you know what, maybe, I don't. oh, but actually everybody at work knows I do. Uh-oh. You're and right. You're, you're, you're right. It's In sort of like- environment, My environment was set up to be reality-based. Yeah. Yeah. And my home environment, also with our with our with our kids, with my wife, with our uh, social network, it was all reality based. It was so your kids were eleven and thirteen at the time. Yeah, right. So yeah. did did you immediately start talking with them, or did your wife talk with them, or I mean, how were uh, they? We did moving? together, and we did um, as soon as we knew things, we shared things. We mm. knew things. We. Uh, conferred with each other on the timing, like, do we want to say something, you know, on this day or that day, mm. but with um, minimal, um, with, with, with just, with just sorting out the timing of it, of like giving it to them, we shared. As it turned out, there was, there was a bit of a coincidence that our um, synagogue about, I think it was three or four years prior, spent three, I, I think there were three consecutive years where we sent a team to Relay for Life. Mm. And, um, and our family hadn't been very directly touched by cancer. I mean, we, there was some cancer in, um, there was, a, uh, uh, my uh, stepmother had cancer and the kids weren't close with her, but they did have some relationship with her and right. she was lost to cancer. Mm. But we weren't doing it for her. We were doing it as part of our synagogue. We were going to Relay right. for Life. Yeah. And the kids yeah. were uh, seeing and hearing about survivors and people lost to cancer and this, you know, this disease. Would, you, know, really, would, would you go stay overnight there with yeah, the Relay? We, on, we, yeah, we did. We, yeah. Um, uh, uh, we, at least some of us stayed overnight each of the times. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and did all the, you know, the, all, all the things that go with it, the, the walking and the, and the, um, people sharing their stories and honoring people and, and a lot of fun, a lot of, 
yeah. um, celebrating yeah. life yeah. and all that. And um, so we happened to, it was really a coincidence that we, there, there were other people in the synagogue where there had been, where cancer had touched. And those people brought this together so that the community, you know, did this thing together. And it was, um, and on one hand, the kids noticed it. On the other hand, it was a little bit of a fun and games. It was somewhere in between of like, there's a seriousness and fun and games. But then when my cancer came around, they had been exposed to the idea um, and the seriousness of it. Um, and when we presented it, we presented it with, um, you know, this is what it is and here's what we're planning to do. You know, this is the plan for handling it. Mm -hmm. um, they were aware there was risk involved. They were aware that the, that the doctors were saying, this is something that, you know, I, I, I will, we weren't saying, I wasn't sharing, I'm afraid the surgery is going to kill me. Because that wasn't really, the reality of the situation was, the track record was extremely strong of people getting through this surgery. Mm -hmm. My emotional mind was caught up in Well, let me ask you then. That. You, but I didn't say uh, that to the kids. But that there was risk involved, we did, and that the surgery was coming and cancer, yes. Yes. I mean, did your kid? I have two questions, Ed. One, one is, did your kids around that time ever confront you with their, a question, Dad, are you going to die of this? Um, they, that didn't come up then. Mm. Um, I, think, I don't remember that. I'm trying to remember. Um, I mean, the, 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 the questions about, about could this get me has certainly been there over these six years. Mm -hmm. You know, that's absolutely been there. Um, the, the, at least in indirect ways, mm -hmm. acknowledging that this is a scary diagnosis, that this is mm -hmm. serious business, mm -hmm. um, uh, the kids had. And the kids did see me in the hospital post-surgery. They did. Um, yeah. They did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, they did. And, and um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they saw, they didn't see me right after I was, uh, I spent a week in an ICU before I got to the normals, you know, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. they didn't see me right after, but they did visit me in the hospital. Um, uh, they were aware. They were aware that this was serious business. You know, I just yeah. want to comment on that. I think it goes along with everything else you've been saying about how you handled this. I think um, I, and I have a bias about this. I could be wrong. And you have to adapt to different people and different families and different cultures. But, you know, you're, you're, you have a remarkable level of openness. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that you're on this podcast, um, the fact that you, that, that it was out quickly uh, even though it was uncertain. There are many people who would have waited and said, no, I'm not going to tell. There were, there were husbands that wouldn't even have let their wives know. There are people that wouldn't let their kids know. There were people who, I've known people in my own yeah. town here that we were close to. I mentioned these people to you in a conversation where the, the person with cancer just laid on the couch and she didn't want it talked about. And she so, didn't want yeah. the kids to be talking about it. And she didn't want to share anything. And she didn't want to talk with her husband about it. And she had a, a network of very close friends, including my wife. And, and she just didn't want to talk. It was very painful for everybody yeah. involved. Um, but you have just kind of almost the opposite. I know, I know with, with limits. I mean, you, yeah. you, your kids were not your ICU nurses. I get that. Right, <laughs> right, right. But, you know, I mean, there was the aspect that I was going to be going through a major surgery that had me um, out of work for months. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a program that was, um, yeah. you know, the program has changed in part because of my health situation, that, it, it, that there are multiple people who are capable of, of making the program work. For mm. years, it mm. was me. It was, it was me and uh, training clinicians, uh, interns and practicum students that would come in and I train a year and then send them off and then the next year and send them off. And it was a Seth show for years. Mm. And um, 
uh, I was going to be going away. For, you know, I, I, I had actually um, just about uh, over a year, a couple of years before uh, or so, I had my first sabbatical. So I actually, there was a precedent mm. of, of covering the program right. and me going away, but there was a lot of time planning to get a different person in who could run it. And there was no war. There wasn't any kind of warning like that, and there wasn't the same kind of availability uh, to put someone in that way. So mm -hmm. something was gonna slam the program, both with the trainees and the patients. Now, did I have to tell them, you know, it's cancer? Um, did I have to tell them? I mean, I, I guess, I guess, telling them I'm gonna do surgery. My plan was to come back. I wasn't gonna look the same, at least for a while. I wasn't gonna be able to work full time. Right, right. For a while, and I did it. I came back with a cane, and I worked a few hours and all that. Um, but they were going to see something. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't have to be as open as I was. I didn't have to say I'm right. having all this anxiety and I'm that I'm, that I'm using my skills for. You know, I. I um, and, but you know, I think I think that some something between you know me, uh, maybe being a little bit idealistic working with a treatment that values that doesn't only value that that um, expects radical genuineness you know and that has guidelines for where does self-disclosure fit you know and that we and that encourages self-disclosure that's consistent with therapeutically you know what are we doing uh, there were enough guidelines there. Between. Now, the guidelines go with that, but as you know, yeah. there's also the guideline of observing your personal limits. Oh, sure. Of course. And so yeah. somebody else might not have shared this. Oh. I think, and I think what, what I like about what you did is not whether or not you did it exactly at work or in that way, because I think what you did was great, but I, I would think somebody could make different choices. But I do think that one of the, when I, Earlier this afternoon, and I sat down and thought about our conversations, and I thought about what I've read that you've sent me, and I thought, and I made a list of all the skills I think you've used from every module in DBT and other things too, like like extraordinary sense of humor. I mean, I was I was laughing by myself in my living room next to my dogs a while ago, reading <laughs> about some of these Facebook posts when you were portraying yourself as Captain Proton you know, because, because you were going to be having a certain kind of radiation uh, called proton or something. And so it's like, and then having these funny things and saying, now we're on a journey with Captain Proton and now Captain Proton does this. And you even involved your wife in one of them, as you may remember, where it's sort of like uh, <laughs> Captain Proton has a woman in his arm who looks like she has fainted. You know, I thought, whoa, there's a, I mean, and you said something about, you know, the picture was more than a thousand words, but it was, but all of these things were, were it was so wonderful. I mean, and I think the humor requires openness to one's own process, it, to one's the world. I mean, you're a, you've been in theater before, you've been a public speaker before. There's DBT skills that help you with uh, expressing your emotions, communicating. And I think these things have helped you. I just, I just have this feeling that you, and you also kept doing things, which some people can't do. Like, I couldn't believe it. I was reading and you, you went to, you were on your way to Mass General Hospital and you were supposed to go to some important meeting the next day about yourself. And you went and, went and did a training at, uh, the, at the Bridge of Central Massachusetts, a program I know well, uh, a DBT program. I couldn't believe, oh, you did what? I, and this juxtaposition of work and then sort of, sort of, now I'm having cancer. Now I'm being an expert. Now I'm having cancer. Now I'm being a normal person in a family. I mean, that transition, I think, is really healthy, but really hard, isn't it? I mean, oh, my. Oh, oh, my. When I looked back, and it was, and, you know, it, it, I'm looking back over those posts and remembering what was there, and I see, and I see things and say, how in the world did I do that? Because yeah. there was that one day where I had... I, I put my schedule of the day just because it was this bizarre schedule, but I did I it. Yes. And I put this schedule up of the day because I had radiation at, at seven and seven fifty. I had, I think, uh, a massage at MGH where they gave where you could get massages if you were in radiation. And I got I scheduled a massage. And then I drove out to Worcester and did this training. And then 
my wife and I, with a couple that we, we sing, we for years sang madrigals at a Shakespeare in the Park, that they met us at a um, American Cancer Society Hope Lodge in Worcester where I had stayed. I wasn't staying there anymore. But uh -huh. we went back and we had them meet us and we did a concert for the residents of the Hope Lodge. Um, and then I drove back to Mass General because I was gonna have more radiation the next day. Oh, it was a crazy, and crazy. I used to live, I mean, that was a particularly uh, busy day, but my, my, you know, my identity has shifted in that um, I've had to radically accept. I'm much slower, you know, I, I, can, I have an earlier part of my day where I can be fairly busy and active, or, or even mm -hmm. then I'm not quite as active, but I have my more productive part of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's usually it. But I used to, right? I would go to work and then I'd be in rehearsal for a show and I'd be with, watch, I'd be with the kids and I'd be, you yeah. know, have this energy oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is, uh, that's kind of in the past, at least at this point. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. far as I know, it's in the past. Um, but, um, oh, but mm. uh, Rosie, the humor part, you know, one thing which you've emphasized in some of your other podcasts of the, the ways to communicate and guide people. And for me, looking at those posts and the humor, that I would pick an image that would capture something going on in the life and that would also inform people what's happening. And that one image you mentioned, which fit a theme I built, the Proton, the Captain Proton theme, was I was coming home from the, the radiation treatment where I was staying for the week. I could go home yeah. on the weekend. And Rebecca was, was um, parenting the kids as a solo parent. Mm -hmm. And I made some comment of, oh, Rebecca's tired from the solo parenting. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And that it was and it was funny, but also deliberate to say, hey, yeah, you know, that we're we're still, you know, this is going on. And um this is our life. You know, this is kind of where our life is. And it's the kind of thing that I, I thought more about this that really invited other people to be able to be light, to communicate with us, to put a like on it, um, but also be able to say, you know, hey, you know, hang in there or whatever it is. Um, well, you have to be, you, yeah. you first, you have to be able to do that the, the way you did. So that's a, there's a personal capability you have that some people don't, but, but everybody has something. And what, what I also liked, that I've said to you, but I want to say on the podcast for anybody who's thinking, that, trying to draw comparisons or learn things from this, is that I thought it was unbelievably skillful the way when people did communicate to you, and I saw this in some of the posts, your responses were, hey, I so appreciate this. Or, and even when people didn't communicate, you'd say, and guess what? So and so and so and so helped drive me to such and such. And, and boy, does that, that's, boy, I'm grateful for that. The fact that you were saying these things and, the, and, the, and publishing these posts and being open yourself invited openness back. And, and then you're reinforcing people uh, to continue to be involved with you. And that, as I said last time, Natalia Garcia, after she lost a two-year-old child and no one knew what to say, even her best friends, she had to gradually proactively take charge of these relationships and say, guys, keep inviting me. Yeah, she, she was explicit. I feel like I was more implicit, but I agree with you. That, no, but that, you, you were very skilled. You, were, it, you, you didn't need to be explicit. I mean, she was having people were all backing off. Yeah. From the start, you, you sort of, without it being self-pitying and without complaining about it, you were yeah. somehow conveying, guess what's happening to me, everybody? Literally, the first post I saw was before you knew anything. I mean, other than some symptoms. And it's sort of like, hey, guess what? There's, we're uncertain about this thing going on. It's like, you began a journey that was a social journey of a whole community, the people who know you. And I, be, and I knew it from, I didn't know you, but I knew you from like two or three link distances. And I would hear from people, hey, did you hear that Seth asked what it is? Oh my God, really? Well, how is he? And I didn't know you and I, I didn't reach out at that point. I just didn't have that kind of, I, I, I Well, I can tell you, Charlie, something, I know we're at time. Uh, something else that I would tell people right. when they'd ask is, um, 
uh, you know, is it, you know, someone asked about you and I would say, well, tell them whatever. And I was very explicit, like, you know, it's really kind of open. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so if people ask about me, go feel free. You know, you can. Um, so, so um, mm. anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, look, we're we are at the end of our time, and as I as I told you before we started, uh, well, I've never done a, one of these podcasts where I don't end up feeling like, oh my God, there's so much more. Uh, so that we fortunately we have another week next week, and we can both think about this, uh, get back in touch. We can and continue next week. And uh, there are certain places I'd like to get, which we may or may not get to, and you might want to get some places. But also, I want to invite again anybody who listens to this can email myself uh, or Seth or both, and and give input or give questions, and we can try to address. Uh, we we sort of wove back and forth between some things that did touch on some questions that were asked this time. Um, so Seth's email is Seth dot Axelrod A X E L R O D at yale.edu yes that's right and i'm c dot robert dot swenson at gmail.com or through my website you can send a message um so thanks everybody if you're listening and uh let us know what you think and uh i hope this uh, turns out to be helpful and and thanks seth again for talking it's really been deeply meaningful to me thank you thanks everybody for listening yeah all right take, take care. care bye